topic called sequences. And when you've got a sequence, what you've got is a pattern that you replicate at a new pitch level each time you hear it. It has to be not separated in time, but uh, in close succession. So you've got these statements of a pattern in a row, one after another. A pattern might be something like this one I just made up here. And what you do is you move it to a new pitch level. break the sequence and create a cadence. What I'm doing is I'm taking this pattern <coughs> and I'm starting it on a new pitch. So I started on C or E up here. And I take it down a third in this case and do it again right in a row. And where am I going to go next? Good. That A. So I've got this interval that's going to change in its size in a subtle way because first I had a major third down, then I had a minor third, but the, it's still a third, and that's the important thing. I'm going down by that generic interval each time. I'm restating it each time a third below where it was last stated. That's a sequence. Notice the elements that I need to have here. I need to have some pattern. I've been emphasizing the fact that it's a melodic pattern, but it's also a harmonic one. There are two chords. underpinning this tune. So you can think of it as both. It's a melodic pattern and a harmonic pattern working together. And that pattern then gets replicated, gets moved to a new pitch level each time. Look at this sheet that I've got for you and the definition on their sequence right at the top. It says, the statement of a pattern two or more times in a row with each new statement of the pattern being a consistent generic interval, second, third, etc., higher or lower than the previous one. We can also go up with them. Uh, either direction works. All right, so that's the basic idea of what, it, what this idea entails, what a sequence is. I'd like you to take a minute now and look at this mazurka, Chopin mazurka in F major, opus 68, number 3. <clears throat> Isolate the pattern first. How long is the pattern? In this case, it's going to incorporate everything again, so it's going to involve the melody and the bottom part as well. I'd like you to put a box around the thing that's being, the, that pattern that's being replicated. Where's its first statement? Put a box around it. Find the next time it's stated, and it'll be at a new pitch level, but it'll be recognizably the same. Box it, and so on, for as many times as you can go on with that. At some point, it's going to fizzle, and I'd like you to tell exactly where that is. Where do you... Where does the pattern break down? I'll get a recording going of that so you can hear how it goes. How many of you have the patterns marked on your, on your sheet? Good. Let me give you a little more time to make sure everybody's got it. Can you see this? I'm hoping you all can see this. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to box it on this sheet. How big should my box be? How many measures? Two. Two. Good. So I'm putting a big box around the first couple measures and saying that is the first statement of the pattern that is sequenced. Now it, occ it occurs again, of course, it's got to, or it's going to sequence it all. So I'm boxing now measures three and four. Can I do it a third time? Mm -hmm. well, kind, of. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Okay, so where does it break down exactly? Can you pinpoint where it doesn't follow? D, the pattern? D3 is where it is. Nice. So look in the second system, the first measure, and what is it exactly that's going awry here? It should be a half note, but it, it's a quarter note, and it's not a just 
Good. Yeah, so that B flat is new. It should have just been a half note F on B2. Right on. Okay, so we can show that. I'm going to show it as like a, it should have been a box, and then it fizzles right there with some, uh, just a dashed line. Can you all see that? There we go. So like this. See how I've left it kind of open? It's closed on one side, but then it just fizzles out here. Okay, so the pattern is two, is two bars long, and as I mentioned, we're going to see that not only the one I played and not only this one, but a lot of sequences in the pattern have two chords, so it's a two chord pattern. It's probably easiest to recognize the pattern melodically, but look at the bass. See how it moves from an F to a C in that first box, and then in the next box, harmonically, you're moving from a D to an A? Now, are those chords all in root position? Just check that, just to be sure. Yeah, that's an F major chord. What's the chord in measure two? C. Yeah. I would um, just say C because that B there is a, is a neighbor. But good, yeah. So here's a C chord. The bass notes are the roots. We've got two chords, F and C, in that first box. And since it's a sequence, every other box is going to also have two chords in it. All right, let's talk a little bit about how to, how to label this. For the labeling part, we're, we are going to focus in on, on the harmonic motion that's in here. So we are going to look at root motion as a major part of it. <coughs> but it's really important to see that even though the roots are changing pretty fast, it's the melody that articulates the overall motion from box to box. You take that pattern at the beginning and you move it down a third and you hear it here. And we want to capture that in our first part of the label. Look down below uh, underneath the definition of sequence. It says three parts to a complete label. Number one, well, first of all, you have to, this is sort of pre-work. You have to do what we did, which is identify the repeated pattern. And then, number one, provide the interval of restatement. The interval from one statement of the pattern to the next. That's the first part of our label. Okay, so first we'll write, I use an arrow to show which way I'm going, so I'm going to say down with an arrow on there. And then how far did we go? Third. Third. Right, three. That's the first part of your label. Where do you write that? Like in the middle of the measure? You could put it off to the side since we boxed it. It's pretty obvious where it is, so you just put it somewhere nearby. Okay, number two. There's a second part here. It says um, provide the root motion from chord to chord. So now we're getting down to details. Inside the box, there is root motion. There are two chords. How did we get from F to C? Down a fourth. Let's write an arrow down and then a four. But then we also have to get, we'd be losing one step in the chain of events here if we didn't have one more root motion. We've got to figure out how to get from that second chord in the first box to the first chord of the second box. In other words, how do we get from C to D? What's the root motion there? Second up. So we'll do an arrow up and then put your two. Whoa, my computer is coming toward me quickly here. So let's see, I was writing a two up here. All right, so thus far our label looks like this. Down three, and then in parentheses, down four, up two. I use the parentheses there to keep the root motion separate from the overall motion <coughs> from box to box. The last thing we do, number three, is show if there's any, any figures, basically, that you'd need. It says on the page, note the presence of any inverted chords using figures. You can also keep track of whether they're sevenths. So any figures that you would add underneath the bass, you just keep track of them here. If you've got each chord in, in that pair, so inside box one, there's a pair of chords. If each one of them is inverted, well, then you'd show that. You'd use six and another six. Those would be the figures that you'd use. If they're all seventh chords, you'd write seven and seven there after this as a third component to your label. Now, I'm, I'm writing nothing there, but that is actually quite meaningful. It means that all root position triads, that's what that 
tells us. So nothing means something. It means that they're all root position triads in there. That's my complete label for it. Okay, so there's a basic labeling system that we've got here, and I want you to try applying it to some of these examples on the sheet. So try the Mascani, Cavalleria rusticana, the interlude there. Identify the pattern again, put a box around it, and each of its other statements. Then go down to the details and figure out, okay, what's the root motion? There are going to be a couple chords per box. What are those roots? And then find the motion between them. And then keep track if you, if you need any figures for those chords. Keep track of them and list them as the last part in your label. Okay, so after working on the Mascani, this is really typical to go, okay, we got the box around measure one and measure two, and great, a box around part of the next one. It doesn't quite finish out, does it? Good. So two statements plus a half, two and a half statements of it, and nicely uh, identified it on that score. Also, number one, the first part of your label is great. You're going down a third. Notice that you could look at the top part for that, or you could look at the bottom. Now, what's the first note in that first box? What's the first note in the second box? In the melody or in the bass? You could look either way, and, it, and you'll get the same answer. That's because it involves, the sequence involves the whole texture, the melody and the bass and the chords. Everything is involved. Uh, number two, you want, to show, you want to show the root motion. And in here, this is written as down two, down two. That's really the base motion, but there's some inversion here so that, well, whenever you have inversion, the base note is not the root. Which chord is inverted here, guys? Mm -hmm. That E in the base is not the root. What is the root? Now, this is interesting because do you realize that this is exactly the same progression as what happened before? We had F to C to D. It's happening here too, isn't it? F to C to D. The only difference harmonically is that you've inverted that C. Now, it sounds completely new and different, doesn't it? In fact, um, you know Pachelbel's Canon does the same exact thing, right? <laughs> That's the Pachelbel Canon bass line, isn't it? But it depends on how you dress it up. What motives are used and what's the rhythm of it and you know there's so many ways in which the music sounds new. It's just um, interesting to note, though, that this is the same sequence in every one of these. What makes this one different, though? Everything's going to look the same. It's still going to be down three for your first part of the label. Your root motion is going to be down four, up two. And this time, the only difference, write a six. Where did you write the six? By the four line? Yeah, I would put it outside of my parentheses. So I would do it like this. Let me see that. Lose mine. I'll do it up here. So I'm going to make sure you can all see the board here. Overall motion, root motion, down four, up two. And in this case, though, we need to add a six there to show that one of those two chords is inverted. I'm not too worried about which one it is. It's usually the second one, so that's kind of my default. I'm going to assume that it's five, three position chord and a six, three position chord root position, first inversion triads here. Um, but that six is all I need to write, and it'll communicate all that. All right, now there's another one at the bottom. Take a look at it. So just to be really clear about that, be sure that you're not just tracking base motion in, in your parentheses. You want the root motion. If there's inversion, that note in the base is not the root. So we just looked at the Mozart at the bottom. This is the flute sonata number five in C major. Crucial 14. Um, so, Brittany, tell us about it. Where does it start? Um, in the second measure. Good. Uh, how long is the pattern? One measure. Good. One measure boxes. How many did you say? Four. four in a row. One, two, three, four. Good. Excellent. All right, so now we need to label it. How do you do that? First part of your label? Um, the, uh, the interval. Up to excellent. Uh, how did you figure out the roots here? Can you give us the roots in starting in measure two? Um, it just starts with an F chord. Mm -hmm. um, and then it just goes up by step. Mm -hmm. That one note goes up by step. 
remember, you'll have two chords per box. So in that box, we need two roots. The first is F. Once I make that change, what's the new root? D, good. And then we just keep doing this. You can hear it kind of winding its way up there. Why do you have to have two chords per box here? Why, why not just go up to... Well, what's wrong with this? <laughs> what's that? Parallel fifths everywhere. So he's exchanging a fifth above the bass for a sixth. And some, so some people call this the ascending 5-6 five six, five six, uh, sequence because of the voice leading pattern that allows the ascending seconds to happen. This would be kind of like Conan the Barbarian music here, you know, just very raw. But we're going to be a little more elegant and avoid all those parallel fists by adding the six and then changing and so on. There's kind of a, do you feel that sort of crab crawl on up? staggered rising to it that's a voice leading issue you're avoiding parallel fifths by that change so again the roots Brittany F, um, F um, G good okay so let's get the root motion down overall we said up to and then in parentheses we'll say F to D so give me the nearest way to get between those two I mean, I could go up a six, but better yet. Uh, what is the mm -hmm. Make sure you can see the board here. Okay, so we've got a root F, and we see a D show up up here. This is a five. Six motion above that. And then we replicate it all up a step, as we said. Okay, but the roots were F and it's a D minor chord there, right? And then G here. Okay, so what's the shortest distance from F to D? I could go all the way up here, but I could also go down three. Go down three. So I've got a new root here, and then I need one more interval. How do I get from D to G? Good. I could go down five, but shorter to go four. All right, am I done? Mm -hmm. Well, starting to add it. Good. Now, that would be totally logical to do six, and that's fine. But just to help us communicate with people who call it ascending five, six, they're referring to this. 5-6 motion as the way this thing moves. It's able to ascend by a second because it does that little voice leading procedure and avoids the parallels that would otherwise occur from here to here. Okay, so I'm going to write 5-6 here not for consistency but just for communication's sake. I'm going to prep myself by using that 5-6 to know what other people mean when they just call it ascending 5-6. So some people will just say that's the ascending 5-6 sequence. You might also call it the ascending second sequence as a shorthand. This will help us know what people are talking about when we hear that. Okay, So I'm going to use this, um, but 6 is accurate too. That just shows that there's an inversion in there. Every other chord is inverted. Great. Okay, so this is another sheet. It says the four main types of sequences. It's handy to know that it's not that anything goes, although there are many other options that show up here. The point of, of this is that you're, at like 95% of the time, going to encounter ones that just fit on this page. And that means you just really need to know and specialize in these four. That's it. For every one of these, there are two versions because you can invert. So we have been dealing with descending third sequences. The first two we looked at, the Chopin and, and the Mascagni, were both descending third sequences. Uh, that is number two. See the two bass lines off to the side? One shows all root position. But if you invert every other one of those chords, you end up with the next bass line, the one right underneath it. Verify that. Go back to your sheet on the on the sheet it says sequences at the top. 
See how jagged that bass line is for the Chopin? Down, four, up, two. Down, four, up, two. Think Paco Bell. Paco Bell Canon? Canon in D. It's that zigzaggy root. Look what happens in the Mascagni when we have the inversions. What's its effect on the bass line? How does the bass line move? Smooths it out. It just makes it one big stepwise motion because every one of those leaps down a fourth, you're replacing that note, that low note, with a third above it, and that just creates a step. So you smooth it all out, and it becomes just stepwise in the bass. All right, so now you can get what's going on here for that second type of sequence. They both move down three. They both have the same root motion. The root motion shows up in the third column. All right, so you see our the label we've been doing here, starting with column two, down three, and then down four up two. That's the root motion. And then we have two versions, two variants. The first is root position all the way, so we leave that blank. And then the other one, we have six, three positions in there, so we just, we'll write a six there. Um, now what we're adding is this conventional term, the first column. So you notice when I speak of it, I don't want to say down three, down four, up two. I mean, that's a mouthful, isn't it? So instead, we just have a simple way of referring to it as descending third sequence. And that's this conventional term column, descending third right there. If you hear a sequence go down, how many options do you have on this page? So a sequence that generally is descending, <coughs> what are your options? Say a little louder. Yeah, you're down to two, aren't you? If you hear it go up, you're also down to two options. This ascending second sequence we just looked at, which some people call ascending five, six, but there's another one. And that's called ascending fifth. So you're, again, you've just got two options. Now realize, though, that those options have two versions. There's a variant involved. So that's really, you've, you've, got, you've got it down to four uh, just by hearing which way it's going. If it's going up, if it's going down, you're down to four, and that, that really limits the playing field. We're going to gradually get to know all of these. Let's start with descending fifths. This one you've heard for sure in a lot of contexts. It's very common. Now, why don't you go ahead and sing the bass line with me? One, four, seven, <laughs> like so. All right, let's try it. One, four, seven, three, six, two, five, one. That is a really common one. That probably rings a lot of bells. You can probably in improvise tunes on that very easily just because it's so natural. Now, with descending fifths, that's giving us the root motion. So you see the, the conventional term is taken from a particular column. It's taken from the root motion column. But if you were writing a tune, and you were to track that tune, let's see, how might we do this? Let's see. If I make up that little tune, how far am I moving that the next time I state it? Oh, there I am starting on the next step down. You can get that from the bass line too. What is the sequence? What does the pattern entail? Two chords. So if I skip a chord, you see how far down I am? It's zigzaggy from, you know, from uh, chord to chord, but the net motion from chord one to chord three is down a step. That's what the motive does. So the interval restatement is down two, and the root motion is down five. We grab the conventional label from that first, from, from the... Uh, from the root motion, the first element there. It's really valuable to know both because what if you're harmonizing a melody and you see a melody that goes down by step? You know that if it's sequential, you can plug in a descending fifth pattern with it right away. You know that. 
If you only know that it's descending fifth root motion, you might never make that connection and realize that the stepwise descending melody is actually the one that you want to use the sequence for. See how that's valuable? Also, when you're listening and you hear a melody that's basically going down by step, well, that's got to be this sequence. It's going to be this one if it's a sequence underneath it, if it's participating in a sequence. So orally, too, it's really valuable to know that overall motion in the melody is going to move down by twos, even while the chords, which are moving faster, are zigzagging their way down by descending fifths and up four. Now, it says descending fifths as the conventional term, and you see it's both fourths and fifths. Yeah, fifths are in there, but the root motion is also by fourths. Can you explain that? Why would we pick five to name it? If you go... If you go up a fourth from C, say, you get an F. What if you go down a fifth from C? You also get an F. Mm -hmm. So it's really up a fourth is the equivalent of going down five. Now, you probably aren't going to do that because you're going to run out of register really fast. You know, if you just keep on going down by fives, you're going to go a long way really fast. So almost just by the nature of vocal ranges and even instrumental ranges, you kind of need the zigzag. You're not going to go C, F, B, you know, way down like this. It just goes out of range too quickly. Um, but I hope that helps you understand why root motion down 5 up 4 would end up just being descending fifths and not involve force at all. The up 4 is actually the equivalent of down 5. Any questions on this? Descending fists and the way it's labeled. Yeah. The first one, the last one. Uh, ascending fists. Uh, ascending fists? Yeah, ascending mm -hmm. fists. For the uh, inversion of that, mm -hmm. uh, does it matter which way we're measuring from there if it's got like up five, down four, or? It doesn't really matter. matter. Yeah, you could write it down four, up five as well. For the root motion, yeah. Let's hear the difference now between this, where everything's root position, and when we have some inversions in the mix. So sing with me now the second bass line on your sheet. So we have a one, six, seven, five, and so on. Ready? Go. One, six, seven, Cadence somewhere or another, gonna get off that train. Now look at descending thirds. Sing the bass line, the first of those two. Pop a both cannon here. Ready? Go. Now I'll do the bass line written. Now feel the smoothness that we talked about of going down by step. This is a rough one. Here we go. One, go. And I'll take a turn here. Good. Okay, so one nice thing about having the bass lines there, uh, and if you memorize what bass line goes with what sequence, you're, you're doing yourself a big favor. The nice thing about knowing them like that is that every single one of these if you know that bass line, it goes with one and only one of these sequences. All right, so if you get a grasp on these by ear, you'll be able to tell what sequence it is if you'll just focus on the bass. How many of these bass lines, the ones, out of the ones we just sang, those four, <coughs> so think of it like this. You're listening to some music. You hear it as a descending sequence. Overall, it's moving downward. You're down to just those four, and you've got to decide which one it is. If it's all steps and no leaps, what's the sequence? Descending third, six, three. Good. Descending third, six, three, variant. If I hear all leaps all the time, no steps, what sequence would it be? Only leaps all the time. Which one is it? Descending. 
And it, yeah, and it's descending. Mm -hmm. Good. Descending fifths, root position. That's the only one that has no steps in it at all. Now you're down to two if you hear a step and a, and a if you hear steps and leaps mixed together. But if one of the, if it sounds like the Pachelbel bass line, then it's yeah descending thirds. The other one goes down three up two, so down a third up a step, down three up a step. Which one is that now? So if you hear a mix and it's not Pachelbel, you write. Good. Down five, six three variant. Descending fifths, six three variant. Ready to practice that a little bit? We'll just work our ears a little bit and see if we can get some of these. All right. Let me stop this.